Hello everyone, Dr. Kennedy here. I wanted to take some time in this video to explain two questions that many students miss on the exam. So let's start with this one. Here's the question. The picture below shows the results of the gel shift assay. All lanes are loaded with the same amount of a DNA fragment. The contents of each lane are as follows. Lane 1 contains DNA only. Lane 2 has that DNA fragment and five micrograms of a transcription factor. We'll call it transcription factor X. Lane 3 has the DNA and a different transcription factor, transcription factor Y. And lane 4 contains the DNA fragment and five micrograms of transcription factor X and five micrograms of transcription factor Y. Now, based on the results of this gel shift assay, which of the following are possible scenarios? Okay, so how do we approach this question? Well, first of all, we have to consider what a gel shift assay tells us in the first place. So let's look what we have here. Here's the gel. And recall that the gel is run with an electric current. And since DNA is negatively charged, if we run a current from negative to positive in this direction, is going to cause the DNA to migrate from here down towards the positive end of the gel. Okay, so the gel shift assay. The shift part of the assay means that if we see a shift of the migration of this DNA fragment in the presence of some protein, transcription factor in this case, it will be shifted. So lane 2 that contains DNA and this transcription factor is shifted. And in essence, this tells us that the protein bound DNA. Okay. So lane 2 is showing that in the presence of transcription factor X. Lane 3 is also showing this in the presence of transcription factor Y. So now we know that both transcription factor X and transcription factor Y separately can bind to DNA. Now let's look at what happens when we put them both together. With both of these proteins together with the DNA, we see an even further shift in the migration of this DNA fragment. Well, remember, the shift is caused by the fact that if the protein bound to DNA, it essentially increases the mass of that entire complex, which makes it migrate slower down the lane. This indicates that the complex is even bigger. It migrates slower than either one of these alone. So this suggests that transcription factor X and transcription factor Y bind to DNA at the same time. Now, let's take a look at our answer choices and see what they say. A, the DNA fragment contains separate binding sites for transcription factor X and transcription factor Y. Is this a possibility? Okay, so we have our strand of DNA here, our fragment rather. Could they have two separate binding sites? Could transcription factor X in blue here bind at one site and transcription factor Y bind at a completely different site? Absolutely. We see in the results over here that in the presence of the DNA, both of these proteins can cause this shift here. So that's a possibility, sure. All right, B. Transcription factor X is acting as a repressor to transcription factor Y through masking. So we talked about two different ways that transcription factors can act. We said that they could be an activator, and this is the classic way of thinking about transcription factor, or we said that they could be a repressor. Now, the way that repressors could work were a couple different, there were a couple different options here. For a repressor, a repressor could bind to DNA.
and it could actually block the ability of the other transcription factor to bind to DNA if the binding sites were overlapping like this. Okay, this was an example of competition. This is not masking. What does masking look like? Well, masking is a scenario where one transcription factor, let's say the blue one is the activator, activating transcription factor. It binds the DNA. The repressor, which is still a transcription factor, can bind nearby. Now in this scenario, masking occurs if the interaction of this protein here, the repressor, can bind up the activation domain of this other transcription factor here and cause it not to work. What does this require? Well, this requires that the repressor and the activating transcription factor are both bound to DNA at the same time. This scenario over here, this result, this shift here, suggests that the transcription factors, again, are bound at the same time. This is a possibility. This is masking. Okay, so we know that B is a possibility. Now, C a possibility? Transcription factor X and transcription factor Y are displaying classic cooperativity. Yeah, if they both bind, one binding could help the other one bind better. That's a possibility. All this assay is telling us is whether or not protein bound to DNA. All three of these are possibilities and therefore E is the correct answer. Now let's take a look at the other question. This question asks, which of the following is true of the percentage of the cardiac output that goes to each organ supplied by the systemic circulation? On the right here, I have the diagram that we drew in class of the heart, the pulmonary circulation, and the systemic circulation. Now remember, the systemic circulation was arranged in series with the pulmonary circulation and the organs on the side of the systemic circulation were arranged in parallel. What did this mean? This meant that as blood comes through the arterial circulation, through the arteries on the right side here, it has a choice of which organ to go to. It can go to the brain, or it can go to the kidney, or it can go to, let's say, this organ bed down here represents bone. The key thing is that blood has a choice with parallel arrangement. There is an option in this case. This is in contrast to series arrangement of blood flow. In series arrangement here, for example, the blood coming from this side of the heart and going to the lungs, the blood here must go to the lungs before it can go to the other organs of the body. Let's take a look at the answer choices for this question. A says the percentage is approximately equal for each organ because they are supplied in series. What do we know about the percentage of cardiac output? Well, we know that it is not equal. It is an uneven split here. Say the brain gets about 20% at rest, the kidneys get about 25%, and the bone, let's say, gets about 5% of the cardiac output. So we can eliminate this answer choice because the percentage is not equal. By the same token, answer choice C states that the percentage is approximately equal. We can eliminate that as an answer choice. Now let's take a look at answer choice B. This one says that the percentage is determined by the total vascular resistance through each organ. Yes, 
this is the determinant of the percentage of cardiac output that goes to each organ. Where is this controlled? This is controlled at the level of the arteriole. Remember, these vessels can vasoconstrict or vasodilate to control the resistance through this region of the circulation. And by doing so, it controls the percentage, the amount of flow that goes to each organ. Let's look at answer choice D. D says that the percentage is determined by differences, differences in pressure, differences in delta P across each individual organ. Remember that the function of arteries is to be a pressure reservoir. This meant that all along the arterial circulation, pressure is maintained at a high level. Let's say, let's use the average mean arterial pressure of 93 millimeters of mercury. This is maintained all along the right side here of the systemic circulation through the arteries. What happens when we go to the venous side across the organ? What is what does it drop to? Well, it drops to about, let's say, 13 millimeters of mercury, just to make the math even. What's the difference in this case? What is the delta P? The delta P is 93 from the artery side, minus 13 from the venous side. This gives me a delta P of 80 millimeters of mercury. This pressure difference, what is it across the brain? Well, it's 93 minus 13, 80 millimeters of mercury. Was it across the kidney? It's the same since the pressure is maintained at a high level on the arterial side and the pressure drop is the same to the venous side. So it's also 80 millimeters of mercury. In our example down here of bone, it's also 80 millimeters of mercury. So there aren't differences in delta P across each organ. Delta P is the same across each organ. Since it's the same and there are no differences, it is not a determinant. It is not determining the differences, the percentage of cardiac output that goes to each organ since they're all equal. The determinant in this case is the, pre the, the resistance through the total vascular resistance through each organ as determined by how much or how, how dilated or how constricted the arterioles are. Therefore, answer choice D is not a valid option, and answer choice B is the only one in this case that's correct.